Welcome to the Hair of the Dog podcast. I'm Nicole Bagley, and today's conversation is with one of the incredible leaders in the pet photography community and really leading some conservation efforts, someone that I am so thrilled to finally have the opportunity to talk with. Please welcome Alex Kearns to our podcast. You're going to love our conversation, so stay tuned. Welcome to the Hair of the Dog podcast. If you're a pet photographer ready to make more money and start living a life by your design, you've come to the right place. And now, your host, pet photographer, travel addict, chocolate martini connoisseur, Nicole Begley. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Hair of the Dog podcast. Today, I have a super special guest I'm really excited about. Alex Kearns, all the way down from Perth, Australia, joining me from down under. Alex is the creator of Houndstooth Studio and Black Cat Consulting. And if you've been in the pet photography world for a hot minute, certainly you've seen her work or heard about her. So Alex, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited that you're here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be talking to you. Yay. Um, Yeah, man, you've done so much. You're such an incredible, successful inspiration to everyone. So super excited to have you here and chat about, you know, just about your experiences. Why don't you give us just a little bit kind of a, an Alex in a nutshell overview of, uh, of your, of your background? Yeah, sure. I'll give you the short version. I won't give you the lifelong uh, timeline version. Basically, when I finished school, I joined the police force here in Western Australia and I was a police officer for about 14 years and I worked at uh, homicide squad, child abuse units and pretty intense and hectic places. And then I I just got kind of, I guess I got fed up with knowing what people did to each other and I thought, you know, I just want a complete change of career. So I left there, had a really bad day at work one day and I thought I've had enough of knowing this stuff. So I moved into the field of auditing airports and airlines for their counter-terrorist security measures. So I was flying around the state a lot, photographing um, photographing animals and wildlife because I'd bought a very cheap entry-level camera at the same time. So I was doing that on the side for fun and just traveling a lot and auditing the airports. And then I thought, you know, I kind of realized fairly quickly within about eight weeks of buying that camera that animals were kind of what I liked the best. You know, everything else still life, tractors, plants, you know, people. I was kind of like, right. it sounds, yeah, it sounds great. You think you're going to photograph everything, then you realize it's not, some things aren't that great. So <laughs> I, I stuck really early on to what I enjoyed the most and what I was getting the best results in, which were animals and pets. And so that started to grow a little bit. I was doing, you know, 100 photos on a disc for $95 for clients. And as you can, you're a very, you're, you are the most astute businesswoman in pet photography probably on the planet. And so you'd know that that's not a very good <laughs> business model. And I was a lot of work for a lot of money. And so that was kind of wearing thin. And I started doing wildlife photography at the same time. And the business just started to grow. And there was a point there where I thought, you know what, I'm not going to be able to maintain, you know, the demand that clients have on me and follow up with their orders and you know, just keep up with all the demands of running a business if I'm also traveling and doing this other job. And in between there, I'd switched from the $95 CDs to opening an actual fixed-based portrait studio, and that's where it really kind of took off. So, oh, okay, good. I was going to ask us, like, did you leave your job still doing that or had you switched <laughs> to something more profitable? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I took a good risk, not a crazy, like, $95 for a digital photo <laughs> risk. Um, I don't think I'd be sitting here if I had of. I'd be at the employment <laughs> office. No, I forgot that uh, little bit. We all start there. I started there at the same point, too. It's like looking back and I'd be like, oh, man, they just shoot a session for like $175 and I'm just giving them files. Yeah. Man, I'm going to make a fortune. <laughs> Little do we know. We just like have no idea what's actually involved. <laughs> yeah. I think my brain was like, if I had a thousand clients at a hundred dollars, I'll make all. And I was like, well, no, that's no, it's just not possible. So yeah, I, right. in there, I had a little portable lighting kit that I used for charities. I'd started, I think working with charities kind of put the cart before the horse. Like I was working with charities before I even knew how to take a photo. So the minute I got that camera, I thought I need subjects. I like animals. Let's go to a few charities and ask if they need photos. So uh, this is like f- 15 years ago, we're going back. So did a bit of research, went to a dog and cat rescue group and a wildlife rescue group. So I had a portable set of lights because I was doing studio stuff for them. And I have a little room in the bottom of my garden, which is now my office where I'm speaking to you from now. 
And that was my first studio. It was really small. And I, you know, opened that up and, and word started to spread. And that wasn't a $95 for a disc of a hundred photos model. It was a proper right. price. <laughs> I, you know, I was still making it up as I went along. Like there weren't people like you and I around then, you know, anyone that, well, any right. sort of, well, I think there's like one photography coach that I knew of that didn't coach in pets, you know, so there's just, there was no access. The internet was kind of just starting out, you know, growing and it was just right. really, hard to, you know, you had to bumble along and figure it out for yourself kind of thing. So. I was doing that and yeah, realizing- people weren't let's say people weren't nearly as open and sharing with business model it was a lot of co- closely guarded secrets. Yeah. So it was really hard to find that information. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think too, at the time, digital was just becoming super affordable. It's mm-hmm. kind of that transition. And so, I mean, there, even in America there, you can count probably on two hands, how many pet photographers there were who were excelling when there was film. You know, yeah. only film because I don't I don't know about you but I take 300 photos a shoot and I show them 30 so it's not a very right. good model if you're shooting film how do you, you know how do you right. 36 roll of good shots that the, that the owner can see I must ask some of those people that I know that have been doing it for a long time so it was becoming more, it was transitioning so some pet photographers were moving towards digital as well and, and everyone was a bit cagey about yeah how they worked and what the secrets were mm-hmm. and, and like you know as we know there's not really any secrets the more you share the better you know, the more the community yep. grows and all that sort of stuff. But I muddled through it and, yeah, it just it started to snowball a little bit when people found out what I was doing. And if you can't provide, you know, one of the biggest problems as your business grows is providing consistent service to clients. Very easy when you have 20 clients in a year. When you have 400, you've got to maintain mm-hmm. those same service quality standards and time frames and communication responses. It can get really hectic. So there's a bit of a baptism of fire for me when I did go full time and finally have yeah. you know, full giving a hundred percent to something. And I had a full calendar of clients and having to service that and maintain the same standard as what I was doing before. Yeah. Yeah. Have you always done mostly studio for your clients or do you shoot on location at all? No, I do studio everything. So pets, um, wildlife, everything in the studio. So for charities yeah. and a lot of stuff like that. Out, and then outdoors, I shoot um, wildlife using natural light mainly for myself yep. or for also for animal charities. I don't do domestic pets outside using natural light, to be honest. I find them quite hard, which is rather ironic. Yeah. <laughs> I can photograph the elephant, but I can't photograph my, you know, the dog. I can, but I'm, I'm just not, never in my mind's eye quite what I want. So, yeah, it's two yeah, yeah. Very, yeah. really different systems, you know, studio lighting or an artificial environment, if you will, and it's very controlled. And then wildlife outdoors using natural light um, where they're, you know, they're just doing whatever yeah, they like. No control. Yeah. Like, but to be honest, yeah. I don't entirely have a lot of control in the studio other than the lighting yeah. and the environment. The animals are just bouncing off the walls. Right. So. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so funny. I've done, um, I, I do mostly outdoors um, because I, I love like the story of it, but mm. I, I do every once in a while. I'm like, Oh, like I long for the, the control of the lighting in the studio. Yeah. But then I get in there a little bit and then I'm like, okay, I need to get back outside. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just always like, I want what I don't have. <laughs> yeah, but- I get bored easily. <laughs> yeah. And I think if, if I'm, even as a studio photographer, if I'm being really honest, I think dogs, especially their greatest joy is when they're running around outside, you know, they're yeah. at the park or they're at the beach and in the studio, they have fun and they love it. But that true 110% inner joy is, you know, when they're running around outside. So, yeah. yeah, it's a, yeah. I, I love having the two genres. And, and even though they're very different, my photographs are very similar in both. So though one's lit with a studio light and it's got a black mm-hmm. or white background, my natural light stuff too is very minimalist. You know, there's no, there aren't any yeah. man-made features and it's just I want people to focus on the subject, not be looking at the fence or the other animal dropping in or you know, that sort of thing. So they're kind of similar in feel, minimalist, kind of stark in the background, all about the subject and not about much else. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So yeah, so when you were were starting, did you find, I always love to talk about like the evolution of style. Did you find it took a while to get into your style or to kind of figure out what you liked? Did you try a lot of different things when you were starting? Yeah, I actually had this really good friend whose uh, wife was an amazing baby photographer and she used lighting and he knew everything about lighting setups, but he didn't shoot. He was just a genius at mm. lighting. So he would come to the rescues with me and set up my lights and taught me settings basically because I had no idea. You know, I was making it up. So 
you know, if right. it, <laughs> and it's, kind of, it's like my motto for life. If it, if it works, do more of it. If it doesn't, don't do it again. So that's kind of how I worked with my business as well initially, that trial and error. Kind of thing. And so, yeah, I initially started off photographing, you know, animals on white and black backdrops. I thought let's just keep it kind of simple. And then over time, you know, my shoots would go for an hour and a half and dogs would get tired and now that's evolved to most of my clients just want black background. They like the the artistic effect of that. Yeah. And black really emphasizes coat color. So I find that there's beautiful saturation in the colors in the coat and black animals on black look kind of really funky and arty. So I moved to that and now I literally shoot those 300 shots in 15 minutes. The dog is in front of me, say it's a dog. Right. 15 minutes, get them in. It's really intense. I'm sitting really close to them, um, you know, probably 12 inches away from them. Super quick shoot, in and out because it's like a big training session and they get tired the way I work and they get quite mentally exhausted. So yeah, it's different in the right. back in the day when I was younger and fitter and <laughs> I'd go for hours and, you know, so would the dogs. And now I kind of find even the times I shoot, I'm not good in the morning because I'm waking up. I'm not good in the evening because I'm winding down. So I shoot in you know, right. middle of the day times, you know, and make sure that you know, everyone's at their peak and, and same for the dogs too. You know, they're not expecting to have dinner and stuff like that while they're in the shoot. So yeah, it's definitely change from where I've gone to where I am I still use the same simple lighting setups that I've always had and I actually have the same ottoman I've had it for 12 years that the dogs sit on and but other than that <laughs> the same thing I, you know it gets clean thoroughly no one's allowed to pee on it you know I'm very particular about the ottoman uh, so it's lasted and that's still the same prop that I've had for the last 12 years that's fantastic yeah that evolution of style thing can be pretty up and down I know for me it took I don't think I really like found my true style probably to like six, six years in. Mm -hmm. And oh, it's just so much trial and error. And it was like, you know, you see certain things you like, and you kind of try to like, learn a little bit of that. And then you see something over here. And you're like, Oh, let me learn a little bit of that. And then, like, I always tell people like, just go out and learn all these different things. And then like pick and choose and you're picking and choosing and you're building this recipe of your style that's completely unique. But I think a lot of people see someone that's successful and they think that it's that style that made them successful, but it's actually their heart and soul that is in that style and their energy and like just what they've built. And it's technically correct. So yes, that's important, but it's not the style. It's all the other things that led up to their evolution of that style. So when you were learning that style, mm -hmm. I guess, were there different influences that you had or, you know, can you shed any light on, on your development? <laughs> I love how you put that because it's so true. You've hit the nail on the head completely. You know, people, people, I find these days people are quick to adopt someone else's style and it's more about mm -hmm. just photograph a lot and really do what you like the most, what you're getting the best results in, you know, in the, and if you like, photographing outdoors under trees or, you know, in the water or on a black backdrop, do what you like. And, you know, one, the more you refine that, the more, you know, it becomes known for you, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess when I was starting out, I, I didn't have too much resistance, I think, in that journey of style. I, it just progressed for me. I mean, I didn't even know I could take a photo until I was in my 30s. And my first photos weren't great. I had to self-audit really heavily to learn and grow. I'm, I, I think all of us as photographers uh, have a perfectionist streak because we're always trying to take a better photo mm -hmm. than the one before. And you have to know when that is getting in your own way. You have to know when enough's enough of your own perfectionism. So I can I'll edit a photo and, you know, even in the beginning I'd edit. I'd be like, oh, it's not quite right. Keep going. And then in the end it was so far from what it should have been. I probably should have just not even started with it, you know. And now I'm better at, you know, right. culling photos and getting through photos quicker and all that sort of stuff that comes with that growth and, knowing my own work and admittedly in the studio I'm shooting for the client so I have to put out consistent pictures you know they mm -hmm. and there's certain shots they want look so my evolution has been um understanding what what shots client, clients will buy like understanding their purchase decisions and they want you know high five looking down um looking to the side full body half a face you know arty catching a treat smiling like all those sort of things there's about 10 different poses I run through in my head and try and get from each dog which in the beginning, I was just shooting whatever I could get. I didn't have a plan. Right. <laughs> I think having a plan definitely helped me. But even the evolution of my business, like when I first started, 
I had this little room in the garden was a mess. It, you know, the roof was leaking and, it, it, you know, the door was always left open on it. It's like a little shed, garden shed kind of thing. With right, right. Big solid walls. It's like proper brick building with a roof, but it's just been a bit neglected. So I was getting that fixed. A friend of mine was, you know, was paying a small fortune to tidy it up. And I had a free consult with a business center, business advisory center, and I thought, wow, this is great, free one-hour consult. So this is a motivational guy that's meant to help you, you know, with your business. And I went there and I said to sat down, I was so excited, I said, I'm going to open a studio like what you have for people but for pets. And he looked at me and said, that will only ever be a hobby. He, he could not in his wildest dreams understand why anyone would want to come and spend money on a photo of a pet. Now, firstly, I can tell you now from having done it for so long, he didn't have probably have a dog. He probably never had a connection. Right, dog. right. And he wasn't my client. Or, or a soul, obviously. Yeah, no, I know. Hundred. Poor guy. I feel sad <laughs> for him. Like, that's terrible. Um, that poor man. Um, so, you know, I kind of think, well, that really didn't work out how he predicted. I left that meeting and he said to me, I only know one person that's ever opened a pet-related business and it's a daycare. And in Australia, we, we sometimes are a little bit behind the trends in the States. So our doggy daycares came a yeah. lot later and people really had to battle local councils to get permission to have dog businesses in the suburbs and stuff like that. So that's what he's referring to. And I left there and thought, oh, well, I better not tell anyone that he said that because I'm paying this money to get the room renovated <laughs> and I'm going to do it anyway. Right, right. It's what I want to do. It was for me, even in the evolution of the whole thing, it was never I want to do this because I want to get paid. It was, this is what I want to do. And in my my small thinking at the time, it was like, I'll work my government job three or four days a week. And then on Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays, eventually I'll be part-time and I can do the business on Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays. And that was my future goal, to work towards a four-day of one job, three-day of the other kind of system. Mm-hmm. I, I opened the studio on 4th of July. 2009, right in the middle of global financial crisis as well. So that was right. you know, like, yeah. a good time to start a business. Absolutely. I mean, you know, that's the thing though. Is there ever a good time? You know, just, yeah. I was like, just no, right. exactly. Just do it because if it's not, then it's some excuse in our heads or it's, you know, oh no, I've, it's cold or, you know, oh no, <laughs> there's always. A- yeah. Right. But yeah. There's, we'll- you're waiting for the perfection. There's a, a great quote that I love. That's just like, you'll either if it's important to you, you'll find a way. If it's not, you'll find an excuse. Exactly. And I, yeah. there's a lot of things about me that annoy me and there's a lot of things I like. And I, I think it's really good to know what, which and which. Um, <laughs> one of the things I really like is if I want to do something, I just go and do it. And like yeah. you mentioned, if it doesn't work, I don't do it again or I do less of it or I do something differently. So I was kind of stubborn and I, I opened the studio anyway. So July 2009, I then put an ad back in the, do you remember the good old days where you had to do like newspaper ads to get clients? <laughs> it wasn't, you know, <laughs> Facebook wasn't even, you know, I think right. it had been around for about two, a couple of years, about two years by then. And I was a very early Facebook adopter because I had a friend who said, I'm going to Japan. There's this website thing that we can join and we can keep in touch. And it was, so I had one oh, nice. yeah. Facebook friend for about, um, for about two years. And then I realized as it got became a thing, people were saying, oh, you've got to get on Facebook. I was like, oh, that's that software I've already been using you know, once a month or whatever. So before Facebook, though, that was kind of growing. You had to put ads in newspapers and magazines and you know, printed stuff. So I spent $800 on a tiny quarter page ad in the local state newspaper. We're now all over the state for, I don't know, it was like a discounted photo session and didn't even offer it included anything. And I got eight bookings. I couldn't believe it. Wow, eight people. And I remember my first sale was um, a pug. It was Doug the pug. Oh, I and love it. <laughs> she spent, it was so cute, little black pug. And I hadn't photographed a black animal on a black background before, but I just made it up, you know, that fake it till you make it thing. You know, clients coming for a service, don't tell her you haven't done this. You just <laughs> advertised it in the newspaper. And she spent $825 and I couldn't believe it. Like, you know, sometimes we, I guess we don't know how much people will spend and how far it can go and people do. And then we realize this is like kind of lucrative. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And then from those eight clients, I really focused on them. I made sure that I delivered what I promised, you know, and I, they had a good customer service experience. They had the pictures they wanted and that then grew. I think the first six months I had 20 clients, just word of mouth. And from those first eight clients and then fast forward to October, 2010. So only about 15 months later, that's when the demand started really, really peaking. And mm. 
I was going to drop the ball and the whole thing was going to implode if I didn't quit my you know, 19 year government career with all the security and right. superannuation and whole leave that came with it and just took a chance on, you know, can I make this business work? How scary was that? Was that jump? Uh, I think scary on one hand, because all I knew was audit compliance, right. you know, government of, you know, nine to five and, and it is quite regimented and, I, and it was safe, but I was also bored, you know, I was bored. Yeah. it wasn't what I wanted to do. I didn't have any financial burden. I moved in with my partner. I just sold my house. So there, was, well, there wasn't a financial risk, but I knew I had to have a backup plan because yeah. you should always have one in your pocket. <laughs> and mine was, if this goes wrong, I will go and work at the local pet store and just sell pet products and pet dogs at the pet store. Right, right. So even now I say to people, if you ever see me at the pet store in the uniform, you know the business tanked. It didn't go so well because <laughs> that's still my plan now. Just go work at the pet store. Yeah. Um, but luckily I didn't, I didn't have to do that. And it was a it was a massive risk, but I had this really pivotal moment. I was still in the government job and I was very stressed about what to do because this was my – I loved this – photography and I right. had all these clients that wanted it. I was traveling, you know, I was doing 160 flights a year. I wasn't home to, you know, do purchase appointments and, and I can't, I was trying to run my business from the government office, you know, right. on the phone, on my cell phone and, you know, it was a bit naughty. So it was all kind of coming to a head. And I um, went to the doctor and I said, look, I'm not stressed, but I need a week off as sick leave, like stress leave from work. I need a, a doctor's certificate for that. And I said, because I just need a bit of a break and need to give my brain a rest. And he said to me, what are you going to do after a week? Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, fair enough. Got me thinking. And then we had a, an animal rescue event at a town hall in my city. And all I had to do is go to the town hall and stand outside. They were outside on the big table and photograph these. They were politicians and kind of celebrities representing this animal rescue event. It wasn't even photographing animals. And I remember standing there and there's a beautiful Indigenous artist called Garamal and his music was playing and the sun was shining. And I just thought, wow, this could be my job. Yeah. Got my camera, this, and, and, you know, it's a lot, we know it's a lot more than that. But in that moment I was like, wow, this is felt like freedom, you know. Yeah. And I remember I rang my, I rang my partner and said, I don't know what to do. And my partner said, you know what, I don't care what you do. I won't use the exact language because there's a swear word. But <laughs> don't care what you do. Just make a decision. And I thought, wow, I'm actually being told that I can do this. It wasn't like, come on, be sensible. You've got a 19-year career. Right. Think about the money you're going to lose. If there was none of that. It was just full support. Do what makes you happy because this is eating you alive. And I went back to work two days later yeah. and I resigned. And I literally have never looked back. That's so awesome that like you, you had the support because I think there are a lot of people run into the issue and I think it comes from a place of love from like their family or their friends, because they're like the guy mm -hmm. at your meeting that you went to. That's like, mm -hmm. there's no way that'll work. So they are projecting yeah. their thoughts of like, there's no way that'll work to them to try to insulate them or protect them from failure. But meanwhile, they're just yeah. like making them feel like, Oh my God, I can't possibly pursue my dreams. I need to stay at this safe job. And quite frankly, mm -hmm. how safe for any jobs, you know, like the, yeah, I mean, maybe a, gov yeah. a government job, at least here in the States is pretty safe because those seem to never go away. Yeah. They just get added. But, uh, yeah. you know, like, uh, you know, my husband works in the pharmaceutical in industry and like that industry is like always being bought, being sold, being spun off this or that. Like there's, uh -huh. that's not safe. <laughs> like I feel like as an entrepreneur, yeah. at least I have control. Uh, you know, and it's a total control. Like I have control for my future, but it's also complete responsibility to bring clients in the door. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's a two part thing, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I like to say I'm completely unemployable now because there's no way I could actually like go work for someone. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'd be like, can you imagine? <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. I only but, get how many weeks but, vacation and I have to ask yeah. first. <laughs> No, that's not going to work for me. <laughs> Sorry, I have to be there at eight and I can't stay till midnight and I can't start at two. Right, but... right. And I can't just decide it's a nice day. I'm going to go paddleboarding for the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what? It's a great point because I have never worked as hard in my own business as I at any time in my career, other careers. Mm -hmm. you, know, you never work as hard as when you work for yourself, but you get the massive reward and I still have freedom of choice. So I choose to work, mm -hmm. I choose to be booked up, I choose to be busy, you know, and I, I choose to do lots of things. I don't just do pet photos, I do tours and I do education and I do 
go to camera clubs and talk to them. And there's lots of things I do to keep it interesting to me and to get out there and really do not just the studio photos for the clients, but the wildlife stuff and the charity stuff as well. So I work hard, but you know, also it's not actually hard work. It's, I don't want to ever think sitting on the computer editing for five hours is like, oh, so terrible. This is the worst job. You know, I might have to stretch, but that's, you know, I'm not locked in a room doing <laughs> right. hours of tax returns, you know, like I'm, I have freedom to choose to do that. And yeah, so I think we, we, when you are self-employed, we all put in that effort, but you also get massive payback from that. And, you know, you are a perfect testament to how far you can take it. And you've still got stuff, you know, sky's the limit, you know. I think you're a massive inspiration in that way to show people not to listen to the people that tell you you can't if they're out there as well because, you know, end of the day, you know, get all philosophical. But no one gets out of life alive. So what are we waiting for? Right. Every day longer is one day closer to the you know, the door slamming behind us. So come on, you know, if that's not enough <laughs> right. education, just do it. You're not going to die from doing something. You're just going to learn, you know. It's, you know, people get scared and, and get in their own way of stuff. And, yeah, I just – I wish people had that confidence in themselves, which is interesting what I'm going to kind of talk about in the Hair of the Dog Summit. But that just building confidence and letting people know that if you want to do something, do it. And if I, I still get people at like events, like random events, it might be just a, a some sort of random function who say, what do you do? And I always play it down. I just go, I just photograph dogs. And they go, oh, do you make money doing that? And I always, and I don't want to go, oh, yeah, it's great. I just go, oh, I, I, sometimes, because I don't want them to go and buy a camera next minute, you know, and like they're popping right. up the studio out the front of mine, you know. But, like, people are still surprised, and I understand that. They're like, do you make money doing that? I'm like, oh, now and then, you know, like, yeah, if you do it the right way and you have a plan and you have a system and you've got a client base and you can grow and build, yes, you can. There are people out there that will, you know, there's, everything can be monetized. There's a market for everything, you know even pets. Yeah. But, yeah. Absolutely. And I, I think a lot of people get into this or they start to look around and they get really kind of down. That's like, Oh man, or they're maybe they're already in the market and like another pet photographer pops up and another mm -hmm. pops up and another pops up, you mm -hmm. know, because 10 years ago there was like maybe one in the city mm -hmm. and now there's a lot Yeah, uh, and it's only going to continue growing. Yeah. But I like to say, too, you know, one of the challenges of marketing a pet photography business 10 years ago was that nobody knew a pet photography was a thing. <laughs> so we had to let them know that, hey, this is a thing that exists and then convince them that they needed it. Yeah. Where at least now, as the industry grows, there's more people out there doing awareness marketing and mm -hmm. then they're going to go to Google and check out all the other options. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's actually helping grow the industry. And there's still so much room because like what percentage of people when they ask you what you do and you say I photograph dogs, you know, they're like, really? That's, that's a thing? <laughs> you know? So like that tells me there's still a lot of market uh, awareness that yeah. needs to happen to like, for everyone to understand that, oh, it's a thing and it's not crazy. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of other people too, even photographers, although the professional photography world of other genres is coming around, mm -hmm. but I remember being at conferences five, six years ago and other photographers telling me there's no way you can make enough money. Uh -huh. I'm like, yeah. I make just as much in my pet sessions as I do with my families. I mean, mm -hmm. it was $2,500, $3,000 averages. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, yeah. A hundred percent. It's a different market. It's yeah. not my family clients spending that on their pets, but it's my pet parents mm -hmm. spending that on their pets. And so I think a lot of people start to put their own money stories yeah. on like, oh, that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Or my, you know, husband or my family says that's frivolous. No one will pay that. And then so they just think that's the truth, but some people won't pay it. Like the guy at your business consult he's not going to pay it but you know the person in the next office might <laughs> definitely I think you're right when I thinking back to when I first started in the early days I used to go to some camera clubs and no disrespect to elderly older men but it was elderly older men right. <laughs> would um would say what do you do love so I'd be I'd kind of cringe and I'd, I'd say I photograph pets and they right. pat me on the head and go oh you know either oh, you'll grow out of it, or everyone does that when they're learning. And I was like, well, firstly, I've been doing it for a while, and secondly, I don't want to grow out of it. You know, like it was seen as right. it's seen as the poor cousin initially of photography. Like you only mm -hmm. do pets if you rubbish at everything else. And for me, I 
you know, I believe that was kind of true for me. I didn't, I didn't want to do everything else. And because I wasn't giving it attention, I never grew in those areas. You know, I didn't want to photograph people. Yeah. So, and I think now, now I always kind of smile because now, you know, if there's a, a speaking event or, you know, a, even a, even a random conference of photography, not about pets, there's usually a pet presenter, you know, there's an animal component right. and a pet presenter. And it's not, we're not the poor cousins anymore. We're not seen as that. Now a lot of um, existing photographers are trying to get into the pet area. You know, they're trying to switch because they're like, wow, I actually really like animals and, you know, maybe that's better than photographing people and they're trying to make the jump. So I love that. And I think we're, we're all responsible for that. Our whole industry is responsible for that. Like you're saying, getting the word out, proving it can be done. You know, the, the mm-hmm. pioneers of it that did it and, you know, and the people that have been doing it for years, imagine those people using film, you know, even 20, 30 years ago that are still shooting now. They had to go through that for years. People, you know, not only the film issues, but people probably saying to them for years, God, what are you doing? You know, like, mm-hmm. why are you doing that? But, yeah, they're still here. They're still sustaining. And, you know, so who's yeah, who's the smartest one in the room as far as all that goes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think, too, another parallel we can draw between talking about when they were back like 15 years ago, we were making that transition from film to digital. Mm -hmm. And all of those older film photographers that were so protective of anyone new coming in the industry, that um, that's going to continue happening Mm -hmm. from here on to forever with the growth of technology. I mean, I see it happening now. I just saw a Facebook ad the other day for some company. I don't know if it's nationwide or what, but it's like, free family shoot and digital images for 15 minutes. And they just pair you up with some random photographer. You don't get to choose. They show up. And, you know, so I think a lot of people just like freak out about that or freak out about like, oh man, there's portrait mode on my iPhone now, but it's going to always continue to evolve. And if we can still continue to evolve and create this beautiful customer service and, you know, create this beautiful artwork, like even with the best technology, you're not going to be able to get the expression and create these images that we capture of these dogs or remove leashes or like put merge images together to a great group shot of somebody's three dogs, you know? So I think a lot of people get really hung up on any, and I mean, it's just human nature, right? We get hung up on any change because we're mm-hmm. scared of the change. Mm-hmm. Our subconscious is like, oh my God, I'm going to starve and get eaten by a bear. <laughs> but <laughs> it's just change. So we just adapt. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, yeah, it's curious to see where, where this all goes mm-hmm. over the next 10 years. Yeah. I would love to know kind of what, what you think the evolution or kind of what the, 10 years from now, like 2030, mm-hmm. hopefully the pandemic's <laughs> done by then. There's no new ones. Um, but, uh, you know, what do you think's in store for the industry? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Uh, and it's interesting too, because I don't feel threatened by te- technology either. And, you know, portrait mode on the phone, it's great, but it's a bit rubbish as well. You know, I've played You're around. Right. You can see like where it's yeah. like, it's like the Zoom background. Yeah. You're like, oh, the, yes. the black background <laughs> interpretation, unless you're shooting in front of a white wall with good lighting and you know what you're doing, it's bit trash no offense to, to <laughs> but um yeah I think it's a really interesting question I I also I think clients was because you know a market can become flooded but you know literally every household in certainly western countries has a pet and mm-hmm. if they don't they know someone who does so it's not like we're going to run out of subjects you know this year we went from a two pet to a or three pet household to now we've got four pets I'm like how did that happen you know like when but we meant to have one. Um, you know, they're multiplying. So everyone's got a few. A lot of people have a few pets. So I think there's certainly enough subject matter out there. And I think as the market becomes more flooded, we may all have to push a bit harder and deeper to find our, our ideal clients amongst it. But mm-hmm. clients too aren't just picking, looking at the photos. There are some amazing photographers in the world, but they have zero clients because they don't know how to push out in the market and reach them and, and get that work in front of people. Mm-hmm. And they're hell talented like, way way talented beyond anything I could do like incredible artists and stuff like that with with that camera so I think we'll have to probably push harder but also clients are choosing us they're not just choosing the images you know they're choosing our us if if I'm at an event Mm -hmm. and I'm talking to someone and they like me they're more inclined to gravitate towards what I'm doing so um, I think people need really good business practices you have to have an ethical credible reliable business you have to be consistent in the way you run it you know bring the clients in run them through your system they pay you because they're ecstatic and they leave happy. That's the transaction, I guess that's what I call it. Like that is the whole focus of the business process, you know, and then rinse and repeat, they come back again and hopefully and new people come in and you do the whole thing. 
I think that might have to really be honed. And yeah, you know, it's about customer service and how far you go for customers that also distinguishes distinguishes us from each other. So the businesses that do have the best systems, great customer service, very customer focused principles, good product for good money, and you know can adapt and change and maybe their style adapts and changes with what clients want to because I think you have to kind of also pay attention to what your market's doing. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that will survive. You know, that cream rises to the top. But there's a lot of room at the top, you know. I do believe that too. There's a lot of pets. So interestingly, Mm -hmm. I I watch uh, entire markets So because it's like really boring fun. (laughs) I like to watch entire global markets. So when the first uh, global recession happened in 2009, uh, the two areas that grew the most globally in the world were entertainment, spending on entertainment and spending on pets. So there was a recession globally, but everyone bought stuff for their pets and they went to the movies and the theatre and out for dinner to restaurants because it made them feel good because, you know, they were losing the, They had some, you know, their little bit of income they did have, that's what they were using it for. And even now in the in with corona and the lockdowns and all the global turmoil i mean this is a really unprecedented time to be alive it's horrifying and fascinating at the same time i looked at look at the markets and in australia embarrassingly initially when we were locked down our highest spending was in gambling and alcohol (laughs) oops and then the next ones were um like you know um uber eats so getting food delivered and there were and and pets pets was in there too and streaming services online were really high whereas taxis and you know ride share services and things like that were low because and cinema attendance and stuff was low so even in this current coronavirus pandemic the spending on pets has still increased and i think during that 10 week lockdown i went crazy with the credit card my dog's got 14 beds she's only weighs like she's only weighs half a pound a new bed for every room <laughs> Pretty much. I was getting them a bed for every week, a lockdown plus four bonus ones because they're a really good company. Um, but that's the thing. Like, you know, I wasn't working during that time in my studio, yet I got the credit card out and I was buying all these dog beds. So our we have a market that, you know, people love spending on their pets because their pets make them feel good and buying them things and having portraits of them makes them feel good. And when you're locked down or there's, you know, threats and stresses, we go to our pets for that comfort. And so I think there's still a massive market untapped market probably even for you know us to get out there and do pet shoots and get paid you know really really well there's lots of room and there's lots of money to be had yeah i say the one place that is never crowded is the place of running an exceptional business and Mm -hmm. giving great customer service and a great experience and excellent quality Mm -hmm. like there is always room for that in any market at that higher level of service, and, you know, of course there's, you know, people get, I think, so concerned about the, you know, the shoot and burners in that lower mm-hmm. end of the market. There's room for that too. Yeah. You know, like just, just stay in your lane, mm-hmm. build the business in a way that you need to build it to be profitable and for it to support the life you want to live, whatever that looks like, whether you're shooting like more volume, whether you're shooting like, you know, super boutique style and 50 clients a year, doesn't matter whatever works for however you want to build your business and then always producing that excellent work and that excellent business sense there's always going to be room definitely and I think we can spend so much time looking at competitors that you it stops us having fresh and unique ideas as well so Mm -hmm. I don't think I've looked at in my city I have a I have a pet photographer it's a there are people portrait photographer but they do pets in a studio hundred yards from my office, from my studio. I don't care. I don't actually do competition. And by that, I mean, I don't, I'm not interested in competing. You just said it, just do you stick to your lane and mm-hmm. just do you. And I find we can look at, if you look at them, you go, Oh no, so-and-so is doing a calendar. I should do a calendar. Oh no, they're doing Christmas minis. I should do Christmas minis. Oh no. You know what? You should just do, you should firstly make sure your core customer clients, your day-to-day pet shoots are being serviced properly. You know, mm-hmm. and, and I, I'm kind of grateful that really early on, regardless of books and awards and, you know, all the other things that have come, amazing opportunities that have come from my business, I learned that that's all great. Um, you know, going on TV, getting the medals from the government for charity stuff, all that, all that beautiful things that have, that have been brought in. If I didn't look after my core customer client, just that person that's coming with their pet for that shoot, there aren't any photos for books, photos for awards, photos to talk about on TV. There's no photos for charity. Because no one cares. There's no business. The house of cards 
comes down. Mm-hmm. And it kept me grounded. Because when you photograph animals too, you do have people, animal people love you. And they're like, wow, you're amazing because you take great photos. I'm like, I don't know if that necessarily goes hand in hand. <laughs> Sometimes I'm not amazing. But, you know, they think you're amazing. You love animals. I love animals. We're kindred spirits and you're amazing. And you can really get caught up in that. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. But I've got to make sure my orders are done on time and I'm still running my business. Because if I don't, you know, there's none of that stuff comes. And I think we can get so hung up on what everyone else is doing that we lose sight. We don't focus our energies into our own business, which is absolutely where it should go. And to be honest, we need competitors in a way to keep us, stop us being lazy. Mm-hmm. Oh, I wouldn't even try if I didn't have competition because why would I? All the business is mine. And imagine my rubbish service I would deliver. I wouldn't, but <laughs> for the example, you know. So <laughs> yeah, right, right. It keeps us, you know, wow, we have to push because if we don't, someone else is going to take that. There are clients standing there with money in their hands going, who wants all this? And if we don't go, I'll have it for these years and I'll do the pet photos for that, someone else is going to get it. And I, that, mm-hmm. that to me is motivation. It's not even competition. It's motivation. And so I don't compete. I guess I'm just really motivated to keep going out there and trying to be the one that takes that money that those clients have got in their hot little hands. Yeah. I I love what you're saying too about, you know, not focusing on the competition because then if you do see, oh, so-and-so is doing this, I should do that. I should Mm -hmm. do that. Then you're just working from this reactive place. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that more people need to do, and, you know, I even need to be reminded to do it every now and again in work and personal life is to sit down and actually ask myself, what do I want? Mm -hmm. Like, what do I actually want my business to look like? Mm -hmm. What do I actually want my life to look like? You know, because it's so easy to just get pushed around with whatever's happening, all these external influences, being super reactive. And then all of a sudden you're like, wait, how'd I, how'd I get here? (laughs) This is not what I was planning. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, but I, I think a lot of people just never really take the time because you can ask almost anyone, like, mm-hmm. hey, what do you really want in life? And nine times out of ten, they'll be like, I I don't I don't know. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? And and the easiest way, like if somebody is stumped and they're like, Well, I never really asked myself that question. Oh my God, what do I want? I mean, the contrast is great because you can ask yourself what you don't want mm-hmm. and then okay, then you start to get clear on what you do want. So yeah. yeah. All such good stuff. I do want to talk though before we go a little bit about conservation stuff because it's close to your heart, it's close to my heart. I spent the first 13 years of my career as a zoological animal trainer, so working with all these amazing animals. My love for the natural world goes deep. And you know, then I I had this random epiphany at the beginning of the year, kind of like a, a download from the universe of, oh my gosh, I have this platform of dog loving photographers, I have this connections from like the zoo conservation world. Need to make a foundation and bring that all together. So super excited for that with the conservation fund and the summit we'll talk about in a second, getting it's benefiting the conservation fund. But I would love to know more about like the conservation work that you do, and especially from the aspect of what photographers can do if mm-hmm. they have a cause that's close to their heart. Like we have the special power mm-hmm. of creating stories and images. So how can they like? start to utilize that or what are their first steps maybe to take? Yeah, sure. And congratulations on the, on the foundation. It's, it's Thanks. awesome. It's amazing. And it's, it's a legacy thing. You know what I mean? Like it's just beautiful. So I got goosebumps when you said that, cause it's just really cool. Oh, <laughs> and it will, and it will change out. It will change animals lives too directly, which is incredible. And yep. you're right. We photograph, well, photographs are very powerful media and, it's a really image centric world out there. We only have to go on Facebook to be bombarded with photos and ads and everywhere you look, there's pictures and colors and things vying for our attention. If we can push out our images, you know, the best images get the best notice. So if we can push our photographs out in that clutter for a, say a rescue organization, could be dog rescue or a wildlife rescue, then, you know, the right image seen by the right person at the right time, it can cause a donation to be made it can you know engage people it can educate it can create change it can create conversation you know it, it's a really powerful media and used the right way it can have great impact so I see my role as with rescues to support promote and endorse what they do and to help raise funds so I do a number of different things I don't actually do day-to-day adoption photos for rescues um yeah 
mainly because I see a lot of photographers doing that, and it's it's fantastic as a service. Like you know, there are there are people that do mm-hmm. that, and it's great. As a service, they need adoption photos, but as a business, I want to do higher level project stuff. Not even higher level is probably not the right word because it's really important to get animals adopted. But I want to do uh, exhibitions and project work where I can really bring in large sums of money or get a you know get, get them in the media, get them on TV. And when I work with the rescues, I'm the platform. You know, I'm not the story. Mm-hmm. I'm just the conduit. So I have great relationships with the media. So if I get a really cool story, I work with like a rescue. They're a cleft palate puppy rescue group. Two of my dogs are from. Aww. Um, I, I'm escalating in my adoption of the cleft palate puppy <laughs> rescue dogs. <laughs> and I have a 14 month old and an 18 month old, and it's getting hectic in our house. We all have our own bases. That's exactly. not a bad one. <laughs> uh, puppies from the cleft palate puppy. Uh, but they take on day old puppies that have cleft palates and cleft lips, and they tube feed them um, every day for about six weeks, and then they have surgery on their clefts at three months old. There's been this amazing pioneered technique. And then the puppies are adopted out and they live happy, healthy lives generally, most of them um, you know, make it through. They're just remarkable, a really small team of dedicated people, yet, you know, they need funds. They need a, their profile, help raising their profile. They need help to get the word out. They need pictures of the puppies. And so, you know, I shoot for them and we you know, have done calendar projects and we do um, photos for their, you know, official website announcements of certain things that the charity might need or um they do use the pictures for these puppies for their adoption profiles and stuff as well. And if I can then go to the media and say, hey, have you heard about this amazing cleft palate puppy rescue, these day-old puppies that would otherwise be euthanized? They're like, wow, that's an amazing story that this group of people are staying up day and night for years, every two hours, waking up to feed these puppies. So in that you know, press article, let's say it's you know an online news article or something, you know, I might be credited for the photos, but I'm not the story. So I, I like to make right. sure I give freely. My personal, this isn't even a business thing, and my personal philosophy with charity and rescue work is it shouldn't cost the rescue anything to work with me. So if I host an exhibition and I sell prints and it costs me $5,000 to host the exhibition, I, my business funds that. I don't take that out of charity's yeah. profits. That's just the way I work. Not everyone can work that way and have mm-hmm. the luxury of that. But And I also don't like to make money off charities. So if um, I sell a calendar and it's twenty dollars, the charity gets twenty dollars. I try and that's my other thing. Yeah. But having said that, I had to work with a management company for a few years to make sure I didn't give everything away because I'm inclined to <laughs> the pet money comes in and then I'm like, oh, charity projects and sending it out the other side. So you know, you <laughs> I totally to, understand. <laughs> yeah, I had to learn to make sure I was still looking after my own. You know, rent my house needed a renovation after fifteen years, and you know, just putting a bit right. And I don't feel bad doing that because I do give a lot. You know, I'm, I mentioned I, 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 got, I got a medal from the government for services to charity through photography. And to be honest, it's a medal that people normally get later in life for a whole life's work. And I kind of, I didn't have imposter syndrome with it, but it might just fuels me to do more, you know, to, to do even more, yeah. more meaningful stuff because I'm quite time poor. So I've got to go for bigger projects than just going out to a charity every day I, I don't have the time to do that to do that adoption stuff right I can do a project every three months or four times a year and there's a good dozen or so I work with quite closely and do those things for so I just love it I also get to just shoot whatever I want however I want too there's not really a brief right. at the time so I love shooting for clients in the studio but I'm always thinking of those poses I was talking about and that outcome because their friend has that half face photo and that's what they want whereas charities are like Alex Here's a dog. You interpret it. We just need help to, you know, share its story, yeah. and raise awareness, or make some money. And so, yeah, I love it. It's I would not take photos of people's pets if I could not then use that time and money to photograph for rescue. Yeah, I just did a um, a podcast. Was it last week? Two weeks. So it'll be two weeks before this one airs. I think mm-hmm. basically about finding that kind of life's purpose, which seems like such a big giant albatross like what what oh my god it seems so permanent and hard yeah but really it's just like following these little interests and following like where you have like this desire to give back and where you know just going down these little rabbit holes and then all of a sudden you're like you pop out and you're like oh wow this led to someplace (laughs) amazing (laughs) exactly and it's just by taking action you know and every charity every charity or rescue even outside photography they need stuff they need someone to shake a tin someone to just look at their accounting for them and do an audit, someone to drive animals around. Like there's a lot of meaningful, even small freeways people can help 
charities, mm-hmm. you know, with their time or, you know, just having conversations and raising awareness about a cause or so many things we can do. And especially COVID, it's decimated a lot of donations to these charities. They're desperate for money. And we have this, like you said, this really powerful tool to help them. And I think in some ways we should all use it. Yeah. So if there are photographers out there that, you know, want to start working with a charity, kind of what's the first step? Do they just kind of reach out and say, hey, I'm interested. What kind of help do you need? And just start kind of volunteering. And then you build those relationships and then it can turn into these bigger projects. Yeah, definitely. I think what holds a lot of people back is firstly that fear of just asking. And you have to ask. If you don't ask, Mm -hmm. you don't get. So, But also research. I'm all really big on, and I know you are too, like just ethics and integrity in the industry. And you mentioned it when you said, don't copy someone else's style, do what you want to do and it'll yeah. evolve and you'll do more of what you love. You know, kind of thing. So I think research the, the rescue firstly or the charity to find out if they have a dedicated photography partner. Because if they do, there's plenty that don't. So no, no stepping mm-hmm. on toes and trying to undercut that relationship or anything like that. That's something that is quite important to me. So a bit of research and then just make an approach. That could be in person. It could be via email. Hi. Here's who I am. This is what I do. This is what I can offer. It could be I can do all your adoption photos. I can come out one day a week or I can do a project for you every three months of your dogs that have been in the shelter the longest or just, you know, an idea. And I make it really clear to the charities that I'm actually not a volunteer. I'm a sponsor providing a professional service. Mm. And I like to set that up from the start because it it helps them value photography, you know, and I I talk about this with my coaching clients like if Ford Motor Company gave a charity a $25,000 car they'd be telling everyone but we give them 20 250 photos valued at say $100 each on paper of in-kind photography and we they'll forget a photo credit you know <laughs> and we're like hey right. so I make it clear I'm a professional providing a professional sponsored service and if they do forget to credit the photo I always go with kindness because their day is turning up Oh, yeah. 16 kittens in a box. That dog's dead. Someone's got COVID. That dog's got parvo. And I'm like, sorry, you didn't credit a photo. They're like hardly in the top 100 things that are important right now. So I, you know, right. really nice. hey, guys, I'm, I know about, I'm so sorry about the kittens, the COVID, the parvo. Oh, could you just edit this and throw a credit on? Thanks so much. I don't, you know, fire them. I don't cancel them. I just go with love because, you know, it's on the list of, in the scheme of things, it's minuscule. Um, but to us, yeah. it's like the whole world, you know, so I just don't make it bigger than it is. And I think two people gravitate towards the biggest groups, some of the biggest, you know, more well-known mm-hmm. groups. I like working with small, I don't like, you know, big ones have their place too, but small but meaningful groups like the Cliff Pallet Puppy. It's technically three people and there's some other volunteers in a foster care network, you know, three main people, yet they save, you know, 60 to 80 puppies a year and it's growing. Small but meaningful work where, a thousand dollars to them is like ten thousand dollars, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, and they're so grateful. And just you don't get mucked around because the rules are consistent. You deal with the same person each time. There's not ten managers. So I like that sort of thing. And thinking outside the square, if you're a dog photographer but you really love squirrels, go and find the wildlife rescue. Or you love cows, go to the farm rescue. Or you've, you know, it breaks your heart that children get childhood cancer. Go to the childhood cancer you know, organization and do something. Mm-hmm give them vouchers, gift certificates or something like just, there's lots of ways you can help. So yeah, put it out there, research, put it out there and, you know, make sure you go in as a sponsor providing a service. That's where you establish yourself. Cause then that, you know, tells them that, you know, your, your work is valued and these images have a currency that they're not paying, but they're still worth something. Worth something. Yeah. And that's a great point. That's a, yeah. Huge takeaway. Man, this conversation has been so good. I feel like we could talk probably for three days about all of these things. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. You're amazing. Thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, but we should probably wrap it up, um, you know, because it's morning for me. It's nighttime for you. It's the lead time zones. But um, anyway, if you guys love this conversation with Alex, definitely come join us in the Hair of the Dog Summit, November 2nd through 4th. So this releases watch that October 26th Mm -hmm. on Tuesday. So we've got one week getting ready for the summit. It's going to be incredible. Alex is kicking off the summit on the second at 9 a.m. Eastern with an incredible talk about helping you get over, you know, lack of confidence, getting that confidence, getting started, like all that mental head stuff that happens when we start our business. And quite frankly, 
even when you're running your business. <laughs> like it never really goes away. <laughs> no. Some people are always like, some of my students are like, man, I'm so nervous for the shoot. I'm like, hey, guess what? I get a little nervous for a shoot. They're like, what? Like, yeah, I'm, I'm still still a human here. <laughs> still have all that same like self-doubt nonsense in my head all the time. Yeah. Oh, but um, yeah, but anyway. You guys should join us at the summit, uh, petphotographysummit.com. Registration is only $10 for that. And that all goes towards the conservation fund. So far, we've already raised like $15,000 for the conservation fund, which is amazing. Awesome. Um, Yeah. And that $10 gets you live access and also replay access to the following morning. You can also upgrade to the VIP all access pass, which Alex donated some cool bonuses. Uh, There's, over $1,500 worth of awesome bonuses in the VIP All Access Pass, plus the recordings. Plus, when you purchase that, another $25 goes towards the conservation fund. So come and learn. Save these wild animals. And it's going to be awesome. Woohoo! <laughs> All right. Alex, thank you so much for this incredible conversation. I know everyone will love it. And um, I enjoyed chatting with you. So hopefully we will uh, chat again soon. Because I think there's probably like four more topics right here on my list that could have gone on for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll see you at the summit. Can't wait. All right. Sounds good. Oh, wait, before we go, let people know where they can follow you and find you. Oh, they can find me at Hounds 2 Studio on Facebook or www.houndstoothstudio.com.au. All right. Perfect. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Alex. And we'll talk to you next week. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, go ahead and take a screenshot of this episode on your phone and post it up there on your Instagram stories and be sure to tag us at Hair of the Dog Academy. And we would just love to see how you're listening. And uh, full disclosure, sometimes we just like to give away a little pet photographer swag in the form of Hair of the Dog t-shirts and sweatshirts. So what are you waiting for? Go ahead and share that screenshot of this episode. And don't forget to tag us at Hair of the Dog Academy. And while you're there, maybe you want to jump on over to our account and see what we're up to on the gram. Would love to connect with you. Thanks for listening to the Hair of the Dog podcast. This was episode number 110. If you want to check out the show notes for access to any of the links that we shared, simply go to www.hairofthedogacademy.com slash 110. Thanks for listening to this episode of Hair of the Dog podcast. If you enjoyed this show, please take a minute to leave a review. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss our upcoming episodes. One last thing. If you are ready to dive into more resources, head over to our website at www.hairofthedogacademy.com. Thanks for being a part of this pet photography community.